Hello, and welcome to Breast Cancer Conversations, a podcast brought to you by survivingbreastcancer.org. I'm Laura Carfing, breast cancer survivor and founder of survivingbreastcancer.org, a nonprofit organization providing community, education, and resources to empower those diagnosed with breast cancer and their caregivers from day one and beyond. Hello, my friends. I am so excited for another episode of Breast Cancer Conversations. And today I am joined with Dr. Laura James, who is a naturopath, am I pronouncing that right? A naturopath oncologist who is going to really help us dive into some of the deep topics that I know all of you have been emailing about, asking about, DMing on social media about, uh, I've been diagnosed with breast cancer, I'm going through treatment, but what else can I do to take ownership and empowerment of my journey and my experience with breast cancer? I hate the word selfish. I think that selfish minimizes the female experience. And we we are minimized in so many places societally and medically. Um, We need to overcome taking care of ourselves and setting boundaries as self-care. It's not selfish. It's self-preservation. Welcome to the conversation. So I'm Dr. Laura James. I'm a naturopathic oncologist, and that's a specific designation within the field of naturopathic physicians. Um, I practice in Washington State. Um, Washington State is one of um, about half of the states in the nation that do have some form of licensure for naturopathic physicians. Um, Here on the West Coast, we have really good scope of practice. Um, I am actually licensed as a primary care physician in this state. Not all states have that kind of scope. Um, And, you know, like I said, not all states have naturopathic providers in state. Um, It's sort of a complicated field. It's somewhat of a maverick field, Um, but it's been around for a very, very long time. And um, about 15 years ago, maybe 20, um, the subspecialty of uh, naturopathic oncology was born. It is a boarded subspecialty. And there are about 150 of us in North America. So that includes the United States and Canada. Um, Canada actually has a pretty robust population of naturopathic oncologists in Toronto, Quebec, and and Vancouver. So um, our specialty really is focusing on cancer care, how to bring the best evidence-based medicine from, um, you know, from, as they say, the bench to the bedside. Um, And we are also extremely well-trained in conventional care for various cancers. I happen to specialize in breast cancer. Um, That is the the group of people that I have just felt most aligned with and that I feel like I've been able to do the most good work with. Um, And, you know, my colleagues see patients with all different cancers. A few of them see children. Um, I, in my background. I've seen patients with all cancers. I often end up being the only naturopathic oncology provider in a given community. And um, and so I see patients with all cancers. Um, I'm in Bellingham, Washington, way up in the northwest corner of Washington. Um, and my focus is helping women with breast cancer get through their active treatment and be healthy in survivorship. I love that. Perfect. I'm so glad you're here. Um, Obviously, because we support all of those women who've been diagnosed with breast cancer, early stage, and those living with metastatic disease, and really trying to figure out, you know, how can I build my bench, if you will, right? I want to have my surgeon, my oncologist, my physical therapist, my acupuncturist, like all of these people in my back pocket. So when I have a symptom or a question or need a second opinion, I can just go through my virtual Rolodex and contact my team. So it's all about, at least for me, to like create that huge team. And I keep adding to it because I have the more people that are looking at my specific case, my diagnosis, my subtype, and everything that I'm going through, I feel incredibly supportive. 
knowing that I'm being watched, monitored, and that I have the resources as my like cheerleaders in the background. Absolutely. I think, um, you know, I always envision it as the patient really has to be at the center. And then there's a conventional team, there's an integrative team, there's the larger support network of family and friends, and then there's um, hopefully some support from the workplace and the community. That's not always the case, right? We know that. But different providers of different specialties, you need to have a team. You need to have a really comprehensive team. And you mentioned acupuncture. Acupuncture is one of the predominant things that I refer patients out for. Um, There are naturopathic providers, you know, NDs like myself who are also acupuncturists. Um, That's a, that was a dual degree program that I chose not to do, but there are a lot of ND acupuncturists out there, many of whom work in the cancer sphere. Um, So, you know, that's a, that's sort of a big bang for your buck kind of thing, right? So early on in the conversation, I have to ask a technical question on how I'm pronouncing the work that you're doing. Is it naturopathic or naturopathic or am I conflating two different things? It's both. both. And people say both. I say naturopathic oncologist. That's just the way I say it. Um, Other people say naturopath, um, naturopathic. It's it's accepted. Both Both of them are accepted. Great. Thank you. I'm glad we got that cleared up and out of the way. When we talk about naturopath or naturopathic medicine disciplines, interdisciplinary care, can you tell me what that encompasses? And and I loved your visual of, you know, we have the patient at the center and kind of these like larger circles growing out with conventional and then integrative. And so would you say that you fall into that integrative domain? Absolutely. I think, um, you know, again, this might be considered more semantics, but I pay very close attention to language. Um, Integrative and alternative are two very different things. And there's also the term complementary. And in different places, you'll see those different words used in different contexts. People tend to think they mean the same thing. They really don't. I practice integrative oncology. I have relationships with conventional um, medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, surgeons who are treating my patients. I am part of the team. At least I try to be part of the team. I try to be very transparent on people's teams. Um, It's not always reciprocated, which is very frustrating for me as a professional. Um, And it shouldn't be left to the patient but it often is, right? Um, Alternative care really is that. Alternative care is going to be, you know, as I sort of joke, um, a left turn at Pismo Beach, um, if you remember Bugs Bunny, right? Left turn (laughs) at Pismo Beach. Alternative care is going to be the attempt to treat cancer without any conventional care. And that is not my belief system. That is not my practice. My practice encompasses, all right, people have this particular cancer situation. They're going to have this particular treatment recommendation. How can I best support that, you know, intense treatment plan um, so that patients can tolerate it and complete it um, and protect themselves in in the various ways that they can without interference. So it's a lot of um, knowledge about drug-herb interactions, um, synergies, um, and knowing what to look for once somebody starts active treatment. So integrative, complementary, they're more similar in terms of terminology. Alternative really is that alternative, looking for something completely different. And that's not what I do. Sure. No, I appreciate those definitions and kind of, you know, setting us straight for what the dialogue is for today's conversation. Does every hospital or clinic have a naturopathic oncologist or someone to reach out to? So, okay. So this conversation then is really helpful because if this is not offered at my center, I might not even know this is available to me. Number one, um, no, no we are not available um, nationwide. And and I think your listeners really can, I think, understand that anything 
integrative complementary alternative is not necessarily going to be accepted by the conventional care team. It is it is unfortunately in 2024 still a you know a sort of stroke of luck if you get a medical oncologist or a radiation oncologist who will be open minded about integrative care. Um, I have I have made it my mission over my time in this practice to develop a seat at the table, I say. And for a very long time, I have enjoyed a seat at the table in conversation with conventional providers. But I also have had some of those open-minded providers say things to me like, well, I can see that you're bright and sane. I'm like, really? That's the bar? <laughs> You know, I I am degreed to the hilt. You know, I'm a little more than just bright and sane. Um, and so there's a real um, there's a real prejudice in oncology as a whole regarding anything integrative. And I think part of it is mindset. I think part of it is also just lack of information and lack of time. And so you know, number one. Anybody in an integrative field has to overcome that hurdle first. So for providers to develop trusting relationships with conventional care teams, that's where the providers need to start. And then if the conventional care team feels comfortable with referrals, then they have to remember <laughs> that they need to refer their patient, you know, because they're already referring for this, that, and the other thing, right? Um, and so it, you know, it it ends up being this this conversation and relationship that we have to work on. And the more patients ask for some kind of integrative therapy, the more it gets on people's minds, right? But overall, I would say the university based, um, you know, big major medical centers. Um, will have some offering of integrative care, maybe. Um, there's an organization out there, the Society of Integrative Oncology, that has a membership of maybe 40, 45 um, big university-based, you know, research-based medical centers. And those places will have um, some kind of integrative medicine. But you know, as far as I'm concerned, it's sort of like lukewarm. You know, you might you might get somebody who's trained in oncology massage, which is very needed and a great therapy, but it's it's only sort of checking one little box. It's not it's not looking at the whole picture. There are a few medical centers um, around the country that do have naturopathic oncology professionals plugged in, but they're rare. Um, and so most of us work independently. Um, and, you know, there, there are a whole bunch of people like me um, who go to great lengths to develop these relationships with conventional care. So we end up being the sort of go-to person on the outside. But, you know, the problems with that end up being regarding sharing of records, right? We don't always have access um, to all the details. And like I said before, I try very hard to be transparent with people's teams. Um, it's not always reciprocated. All right. And then that puts a burden on the patient too, having to be the middle person of collecting records, sharing records, or we're not the medical experts either. So, you know, I could be sharing with you, like what I think my diagnosis is, but you might glean more from the pathology report than I can verbally share, et cetera. So exactly. Exactly. And I think, you know, I, I absolutely understand the burden of care for women with breast cancer. And when you add the burden of advocacy on top of that burden of care, it's like, holy moly, this is way too much. Um, right. It's way too much. So I, you know, I've been accused of, of, my charts being too thorough, um, of my charts being too narrative. And it's, it's a good thing that my undergraduate degree was actually in creative writing because I do write great charts and I write a lot of notes for people to go on. 
and patients have access to that stuff. And, you know, they're not always going to remember, but at least I try and advocate that way as well. Can you take me into a day in the life? Someone who's been diagnosed with breast cancer and is looking to meet with you for the first time to talk about what their treatment plan would look like with a naturopathic oncologist. Um, So I see women with all types of breast cancer at all stages. And, um, you know, I understand that a metastatic diagnosis is a much um, is a much heavier thing um, for women than a stage zero, you know, DCIS kind of breast cancer diagnosis. But um, you either have a little bit of cancer or you have a lot of cancer. And there's going to be a standard of care, right? We we have to start with that standard of care. Um, and so looking at standard of care, um, what's coming down the pike for a given woman with her given diagnosis? So I really see... Um, Active treat, you know, there, there's a difference, right, between active treatment and then what happens after active treatment. And so generally, I start from the place of, well, crap, you've got cancer and it's nothing you did, right? It is, in most cases, random. Um, and we're going to think about this like a hurricane. You are in your house and you know there's a hurricane coming. And you have to batten down the hatches and put the boards up on the windows and clean out your fridge and do all the things in preparation for the hurricane that you know that's coming. And then you just have to hunker down and get through the hurricane. And when the hurricane is over, you start taking the boards off the house. You start looking at what kind of damage was done to your house. And then you focus on cleanup. So I think that a cancer diagnosis, cancer active treatment, and then post-active treatment, um, it's a good visual to keep in mind. You just have to get through the storm and I'm going to help you do that, right? And so it's phasic. And within that storm, within that active treatment, there are different phases. You'll have, you know, your your diagnostic phase. And the, the best place for me to start with a patient is when they're first diagnosed, because we can we can do a very comprehensive sort of global plan and and try and direct where that storm might hit, right? Um, But so there's the diagnostic phase, and then there's either the, you know, neoadjuvant chemotherapy, the chemo before surgery, or we have surgery first. But there's going to be a surgery phase, most likely a chemotherapy phase, often um, a radiation phase, often, right? And then there's the, for the 70% of women with ER positive breast cancer, there's the anti-estrogen therapy conversation, right? And people love to get ahead of themselves because they're so anxious. And I get that, but I also recognize that there's so much work to do before we get to the conversation of 10 years of Arimidex, right? Um, There's so much work to do before we get to that, that I have to like rein people in and say, all right, we're going to focus on this part of your care right now. And so I try to help women really understand what their diagnosis is and why their pathology report is going to dictate what their treatment plan is. And I want, I want women to leave smarter about their cancer. I want women to really understand. And, you know, the the women who I think become unicorns in this conversation about chronic breast cancer, metastatic breast cancer, are women who do have a good handle on their disease, right? And who are potentially working in medically adjacent fields, right? So who have some language and language is so important. And, you know, people have said to me, you know, when I was in medical school, they're like, oh my God, how are you doing? You know, your, your background is in writing. And I mean, I had a minor in biology as well, but, you know, I said, medicine's a language. 
You know, yes, I'm being sprayed by a fire hose, but medicine is a language. And if you learn the language and you can speak it effectively, that's empowering, right? Mm -hmm. So, So I start with this phasic approach. Let's understand your diagnosis. We know what your standard of care therapy is going to be. So if someone's looking down the barrel at dose dense adriamycin, cytoxin, and taxol, I even break that down even further, right? And I say, okay, you're going to start with AC. So how are we going to protect you from AC? And then how are we going to help you manage the side effects and prevent peripheral neuropathy from Taxol, right? So it's it's a lot of breaking it down into smaller, more manageable pieces. And my treatment recommendations are different for each of those phases. You know, one of the things that I that I have to like bite my tongue a lot of the time is when patients will come in and they'll say, oh, my cousin sent me this product that's supposed to cure cancer. And I'm like, okay, here we go. (laughs) Let's back up a little bit. Right. (laughs) Exactly. And all cancers are different and all the subtypes behave a little bit differently and you have all these different markers. Right. So it's, it's all of that sort of conversation as well. Right. I always joke that like you get diagnosed with cancer and then everyone has an opinion about your diagnosis and everyone has a story and a recommendation. And, you know, I know my listeners know that, you know, prior to my diagnosis, I was a strict vegan um, for a number of years. I started off at the age of 16 being a vegetarian and then slowly gradated up to, to being a vegan for almost 20 years. And people would be like, do you eat kale? Do you eat mushrooms? Like, have you tried these things? Like more broccoli? I'm like, oh my God, like cancer doesn't discriminate. And I love what you mentioned at the beginning is that this is not our fault. This is not something that we brought on to ourselves because I think also as women, we tend to go through, what did I do wrong? What what caused this? This is my fault. And then we'd go very internally, which I think can also have a very negative outcome on how we're responding to treatment as well. So I think kind of that mental and psychological component of how we're navigating the diagnosis plays a critical role in potential outcomes as well. And so being able to help us figure out in the present moment what we're going through and can we survive, you know, a couple hours in the infusion chair? Did we get through those couple hours? Great. Let's go home now and reassess. So I love that you kind of put it in bite-sized pieces and then really meet the patient where they are in that experience because Yes, you hear the words cancer and then you're like, I'm planning my funeral and writing my will. Like that's really how it goes, zero to 60, right? Say that cancer is a wily beast. You know, the the brilliance of our medical profession spends, you know, 70% of its time focusing on cancer and what can we do to cure cancer and you know these are the folks in R&D at big pharma and you know providers and all these people and we still haven't figured it out right it's it's not so simplistic that there's going to be one thing or even that there's going to be 10 things but you know i think that I think that trying, you know, I never ask for a patient to become an oncologist. That's not what I'm saying. But to have some language, to have some idea of the fact that that this can often be a moving target and that because it's a moving target, we have to come at it in a whole bunch of different ways. You know, cancer is a metabolic disease. And so we need to address what I call the biochemical terrain of the body, which is influencing that metabolic action of cancer cells. And so, you know, it's not your fault, but if you've been really stressed out for the two years before your cancer diagnosis, because you've been going through a divorce or you've been caring for an aging parent or whatever, those stress hormones can influence global inflammation in your body, can dysregulate blood sugar, can affect hormone metabolism. You know, there are all these things happening at the cellular level. And this is where mind-body connection really comes into play because, all right, yeah, you got cancer, big bummer, but let's look at 
the future and how you're going to a recover from the storm of conventional treatment and b have a really healthy survivorship because cancer is a wake up call for a lot of people. Right. And so they get to the end of their treatment and I'm like, Oh, I'm not going to do that again. I'm not going to smoke. I'm not going to, you know, whatever people make huge lifestyle changes and they make attitudinal changes as well. Right. Um, and so that's what we're trying to identify and support. You got me really curious about this like kind of metabolic health and this disease and kind of that microenvironment that our cancer cells are either dying or flourishing in. How, so I've never met with someone like you. So I like want to find someone in Massachusetts and be like, okay, assess me, what's going on? How can I make sure that in my survivorship plan, I am not reverting back to those stressful um, triggers that used to like, you know, be a workaholic, get not enough sleep, probably overeat too much junk food, not get enough exercise and, or use, you know, you, I think you're mentioning herbs to kind of help detox the body for some, some of us. I know when we're going through this active treatment, you know, we're, we're giving ourselves like the most harsh chemicals that can either be very targeted and, you know, affect just where your tumor is, or they could be systemic and affect your entire body. And, you know, I'm really concerned about liver health and all of these other things that kind of bubble up as, the storm subsides, you're realizing that you're also dealing with a lot of the aftermath um, and longer term side effects. Um, You know, another example would be if you had radiation, I had radiation on the left side of my chest. And so I'm very concerned now about my heart health and cardiovascular health. And then as I'm putting more people in my back pocket, I now see a cardiologist oncologist, right? And so really just, you know, things I didn't plan to sign up for, but realizing that it is one of those unfortunate gifts that keep on giving and showing up in a variety of ways in terms of managing one's health. So I kind of just like threw a blanket out there for you, but I would love to maybe have you like respond to that survivorship piece and then really how we can help support the the inner workings of our body so that we can optimize our health. Long time I've done, or for a long time I did women's health and women's cancers clinically. So I was seeing women who didn't have a, a cancer diagnosis and this was early in my practice life um, and when I was still in my 30s. And um, I talked to a business coach at that point in time. And I was trying to figure out how to navigate this somewhat crowded field of naturopathic providers in um, in Washington. And, um, and I was running a big clinic. And the business coach had me do a whole bunch of exercises. And one of the exercises led me to, well, shoot, I should just focus on helping women with breast cancer. This encompasses everything that I like to do for women's health. And, you know, I looked at that and I talked to my business partner and I talked to my husband and I talked to some friends and they were like, oh, don't narrow yourself so much. You know, don't don't make your clinical focus so small that, you know, you won't be able to grow it. And here I am 20, you know, at 23 years of clinical practice. And what am I doing? I'm focusing entirely on women with breast cancer because this is the bomb, right? This is the place where we can, as providers, have so much positive effect in all of these places around women's health. And, you know, it's really, as you said, you have to consider heart disease, you have to consider osteoporosis. You know, it's not necessarily the breast cancer that's going to kill you down the road, right? And, you know, especially if you've had a drug like adriamycin and maybe there's some cardiovascular health issues in your family, so there's a genetic risk, you do have to pay attention to your cardiovascular health. And so, you know, for for a long time, I've managed patients after, well after their active treatment for breast cancer. I sort of become like a primary care physician for women who've had breast cancer because I can keep that filter in place of, oh yeah, you had that drug. Oh yeah, you had radiation. Oh yeah, these are the things that we're looking for. Oh yeah, you're on a Remedex that's going to decrease your bone density, right? So in terms of survivorship, that's one comment. The the other piece, and, and this is what really makes me a naturopathic provider, is that the four cornerstones, as I call them, are 
the most important place for you to start because it's your foundation of that house that's going through the hurricane, right? And the four cornerstones are diet, exercise, sleep, and stress management. And, you know, nutrition, that would probably be a whole nother podcast, Laura. Um, exercise is really the number one thing that women can do after a diagnosis of breast cancer to reduce their risk of recurrence. Um, so exercise is key. Sleep is like the ignored little sister, right? People don't get enough sleep. And as my, I, I had the, the good fortune of having a study buddy through my whole time in medical school who had been a sleep tech and her focus as a naturopathic provider now is sleep medicine. And she constantly reminds me that there are 58 different sleep disorders. There's not just insomnia or good sleep. There are 58 different sleep disorders. And so, you know, sleep does not have enough emphasis on it, right? And then stress management, we're all aware of how stressful our modern life is and add a cancer diagnosis on top of that and your stress goes through the roof. So, you know, having um, great stress management techniques is really important long term, whether you're recovering from breast cancer or you're trying to prevent a heart attack or, you know, all the things, right? So those four cornerstones really plug in with any chronic disease, whether it's diabetes, heart disease, or breast cancer. So that's where we need to start. These were conversations I was having with people 30, 35 years ago. Now it's very trendy, right? Now we have a lot more information scientifically, but we also have a lot more information um, influentially. And what I mean by that is online influencers who are touting, you know, kale or whatever it is. Right. And, and, and people are paying attention to that. Right. So, um, you asked me early on, and I can't remember if we were being recorded or not, but, um, about different types of providers and sort of being able to weed through the, um, the degrees and the licenses and the scopes and all that kind of stuff. And so much of this four cornerstone concept is trendy now. And I would caution people to look very closely at a provider's credentials before signing up for their program or their class or going to see them. You know, there are very strict Department of Health licenses out there. Um, and education is the most important thing. So naturopathic doctors are those who've gone to a four-year accredited naturopathic medical school, period. It's same thing, like too, we talk a lot about like lymphedema as one of the side effects mm -hmm. and you just don't want to go to any massage therapist, but to find the one that right. is specifically trained in lymphatic massage, et cetera. So right. this is, you know, right. you're, you're ringing the bell. Right. Absolutely. Exactly. I, I happen to also have my, um, certified lymphedema therapy, um, certification, um, as well as I've just gotten a grief education, um, oh, certification okay. as well from the David Kessler, um, group. And, um, yes, I feel I like mean, we just need to hire you. Like you just need to come into like the surviving breast cancer.org <laughs> community, because these are all the things too, that we talk about. Um, because when you're diagnosed with breast cancer, there's a flood of emotions and there's the physical and the mental, mm -hmm. the spiritual side, everything that we're going through. And, you know, for people, some people just gravitate to our podcast and love listening to our podcast, but we do have a variety of programs also, such as weekly meditations that we have this amazing guru lead 15 minutes of meditation every single Monday. So it's not a big time commitment, but it's 15 minutes on a Monday. And we record all of the sessions and they can be listened to later through our app for people to just have, now we have like a library of like 50 different types of meditations, but I think, you know, providing the resources for people to find a way to decompress, de-stress, create a wellness practice around mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's so much easier said than done. Like I'm creating these things and I can tell you, I don't do it all the time myself. So right. like I need to take my own advice, right. but right. it's, it's a hard balance of you know, exercise, diet, getting enough sleep, 
The other comment um, that you triggered in my mind not too long ago, we did a podcast interview with a woman who is working on a project called on Instagram. It's referred to as the Nifty 150. And so she is referring to um, getting 150 minutes of exercise as per the national guidelines for yep. exercise and health. And she reminded me like, Laura, it's okay if you only get to 130. It's okay if you don't get to the 150. The fact that you're moving your body Mm -hmm. is perfect. And like, that's what we want to encourage. And so this idea of like, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. You can have a lot of salad and still indulge in a piece of chocolate cake and sugar is not going to kill you. Right. People come to me and they're often surprised by what I have to say. And, you know, I, I definitely get the folks who are interested in a completely alternative plan for their cancer care. And they come to the naturopathic doctor who says to them, no, you really have to do chemo and I'm sorry, but I'm going to support you through it. Right. So I get those people. And then I get people in the integrative space who are very passionate about whatever dietary intervention or, you know, whatever it is. And there's so much information on the internet, whether it's good information or bad information. And what it always boils down to for me is quality of life, right? Quality of life is so important. And it is It is not worth being draconian about nutritional intervention. It is not worth being, you know, it is not worth (laughs) self-flagellating to to get from point A to point B. It is really all about moderation, but mindful moderation. So, you know, I go through this whole spiel about how I want people to be eating. And I don't advocate that people become vegan or even vegetarian, you know, and I'm looking at nutrition both from quality of food, but how does that food behave in the body as a carbohydrate, as a protein, as a fat, those kinds of things, right? And then there's this big question about alcohol. And, you know, when I first started working with women with breast cancer, the recommendation was no more than three drinks a week. Um, If you've had breast cancer and you have to be honest about what that drink is, it's, you know, one and a half ounces is a shot, five ounces is a glass of wine, 12 ounces is a beer, right? It's not those great big wine goblets that people get at restaurants, right? That's like three drinks right there. Uh, What I end up saying to people is 20, 80% of the time, I want you to eat this more prescribed, scientifically supported way of eating, which is healthful across the board, right? This is the way you're going to have a healthy diet. And, you know, 80 to 85% of the time, 15 to 20% of the time, eat the birthday cake right? It, eat the birthday cake, go have fun, right? Laughter, social connection, enjoyment, those things are really important too, right? But you have to be honest about those percentages. You know, you have to be honest that it is only 15 to 20% of the time. If you're sitting around eating the birthday cake every day, you're not being honest with yourself and maybe then you need to take a different tack, right? That accountability and honesty piece is is key. And I read um, a great piece that resonated with me because I work really hard during the week and then I use my weekends to like relax, rejuvenate, let go, have the birthday cake or the wine or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But then when I was reading, it was like, but you can't have your vacation 52 weeks out of the year. Mm -hmm. I'm like, you're right. I can't go on vacation 52 weeks out of the, right? So like really kind of using my mindset to change what my weekends looked like, Mm -hmm. but then allowing, you know, if I'm, you know, at my niece's birthday party, of course, I'm going to enjoy like the pizza for like the two-year-olds and the four-year-olds and the pizza and all the the cake and everything. But that's not every single weekend. Profound books that I've read in the last year is a book um, called Real Self-Care. If I'm there is actually a woman who's a psychiatrist and her name's Pooja Lakshmi. And um, 
this book was so profound for me because the primary focus is that real self-care is about setting boundaries. It's not about eating the birthday cake. <laughs> you know, it's not about, um, you know, getting a massage and, and lighting candles in your, you know, bathroom. It's about setting boundaries. And what you have to do first, though, is figure out what your boundaries are going to be, right? And then there's the discipline of maintaining them. But being, and, and this is so pertinent for women with breast cancer because of all the buttons that get pushed when you have this diagnosis, right? So you get the people giving you information, you get the people, um, you know, thinking they're being helpful, but maybe that's not the help you need right now. And there's a boundary that you can, that, that you have to set, right? And you have to be able to feel comfortable enough to say, you know, Aunt Martha, I love you, but I don't need another casserole you know, kind of thing. Right. And so, you know, real self-care is that mental discipline. It has nothing to do with any of these material things. It has nothing to do with nutrition. It has nothing to do with all of these pieces that we're talking about. Right. It has to do with knowing yourself and knowing what you're willing to put up with or live with or what you want. Right. So have you been able to incorporate some of these boundaries in the last year since having read this book? And has that changed? Like, how has that changed or impacted your life? I'm curious. Well, you know, it's it's an ongoing dance, right? It's really an ongoing dance. I think one of the things that I've done personally, and I've had, you know, I'm I'm in my mid-50s. My youngest kiddo just graduated from high school last month. My elderly father is failing and I'm his power of attorney. Um, and this is round two. I took care of my mother. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a very challenging time of life. Not that there isn't a non-challenging time of life, except maybe when you're five. Um, uh, you know, I think that one of the things that I've been able to do is, number one, take a break. Um, I have stepped back from one-to-one -one clinical care for the time being um, because I'm very focused on my dad and he lives two hours away. Um, and also surrounding myself with people who are also givers as opposed to takers. And, and, and this is a, this goes back to, you know, talking about this concept of resilience, right? Um, and resilience is often a boundary setting issue as well. Um, and we have to take steps, I think, to protect ourselves, whether it's protect ourselves emotionally or protect ourselves physically or protect ourselves from something that we know is going to stress us out, right? And when you can surround yourself with people who are of that same mindset, who are, um, you know, like I said, who are givers as opposed to like battery drainers, right? And, and this is all part of what's going to come to light with a cancer diagnosis, right? And, and this, is, this is an emotional piece that can make things really hard um, because you're going to get people across the spectrum dealing with their own response to your cancer diagnosis, which you're not responsible, right, for their response. You're responsible for your own response, um, but that's hard when you're female and when you're used to taking care of people and all of a sudden you're the focus, right? Yeah. I remember when I was diagnosed, like I said, I was, I still think I'm kind of a workaholic, but not in like the bad sense. <laughs> but at the time, you know, I had so much on my plate that I remember being diagnosed. And then the next thing I had to do after telling my employer was cancel all of these upcoming obligations that I mm -hmm. was responsible for. I was leading a group of students on a trip to Chile that I had to find um, a, an alternative faculty member to attend on my behalf because I was like, I just got diagnosed. I'm starting treatment in two weeks, right? With the neoadjuvant chemotherapy, there was no time to like 
pause. Mm -hmm. I was presenting at a conference later that month. I was going on, like all of these things were happening and I had to like literally cancel all of these professional things I was looking really forward to. But then it made me realize when I looked at my docket, like how much I was taking on and literally it took a cancer diagnosis for me to like literally pause and like take care of myself. Mm -hmm. My husband now boyfriend at the time was kind of like the bad cop and he took on that role, which I really appreciated. He was the one to say, you know, have everyone call me. I can give them the medical updates because you're going to be too exhausted to be repeating yourself again and again after every medical appointment. Or if friends wanted to come over, you know, after, you know, an hour of like tea and muffins or whatever they brought, it's like, okay, you should go. She really needs to take a rest now. And so to have someone be that voice for me was really instrumental, I think, because I would... I wouldn't have had the guts to say, no, please leave. I need to rest because again, being the female, I don't want to offend somebody. I don't want to upset somebody. I wasn't thinking of me. I was thinking more of like, well, this person came to visit me. That's so nice. So I might as well spend time with the person. So to, I think, have that bad cop, if you will, to like advocate for your time, um, to create those boundaries for me was a tool that worked really well. Glad that you had that with your experience. Um, I wish every woman had that. And, and I want to, I want to just call out because I think this is something we struggle with as women. Um, you use the word selfish and I hate the word selfish. I think that selfish minimizes the female experience and we, we are minimized in so many places societally and medically. Um, We need to overcome taking care of ourselves and setting boundaries as self-care. It's not selfish. It's self-preservation. And, you know, we are women who are the, the, you know, strong women that we are, we're in the professions that we're in, we have the families that we have, you know, whoever we are as women, there's enough coming at us that minimizes our experience that we need to push back on that. So I'm not going to use the word selfish. I am going to use the, the concept of executing self-care um, because, you know, I'm worth it. And so are you. Right. Thank you for helping You're, me with brain that. That was so helpful. Box, Laura. <laughs> yes. Oh, I love it. Fantastic. So, I mean, women empowerment, you know, I think one of the underlying themes that's coming out in today's dialogue is, is that of like the feminine side of breast cancer, the, the whole woman, not just like the physical, but kind of this underweaving tone that happens from societal context how we were brought up, how we were raised, how we self-identify or project onto ourselves, et cetera. And so it sounds like you see a lot of that throughout your work as a naturopathic mm-hmm. oncologist. Can you talk a little bit more about kind of that intersection? Yeah, you know, of the acceptance of integrative medicine in cancer, you know, there was a study done like 30 years ago that said that 70% of cancer patients use some form of alternative medicine, but the majority of them don't tell their medical oncologists, right? Um, you know, in Washington state, the figure is 83%. Um, it's the same thing about a person's actual feelings going on about the whole experience. Um, the women that I see tell me everything. Um, but I also ask, right. I ask questions about how are you doing in your intimate relationship? You know, how are you doing at work? Are you getting the support you need at work? You know, I had a horrific, um, uh, situation or a patient of mine had a horrific situation last year where upon her diagnosis, her workplace actually piled more public facing work on her plate. And she had to fight for FMLA. And, you know, she was afraid that she wasn't going to get a job in her field if everybody knew she had breast cancer. And I mean, it was a mess. And I tried to connect her with a with an employment lawyer and, you know, all this kind of stuff. But it was it was so, I mean, it was like, it was the 1950s and I'm like, really? Um, but, you know, I think that 
women who come to see me, a lot of them, not all of them are comfortable about talking about all the things. And, um, and so I try and, and support that because I know that all the things are not being talked about in other settings. Right. And, you know, part of the work that I'm trying to do is open these conversations, you know, either in the, you know, doctor patient relationship or in the workshops that I've started doing. Um, and this is part of the healing. This is part of the medicine, right? This is part of helping a woman navigate what can end up being a chronic disease and, um, you know, finding the right people to talk about things. And it might not necessarily be someone you're close to, right? Often we get an incredible amount of support from perfect strangers, right? Community can be really important. And, you know, I get, I get really frustrated with support groups, right? And I think a lot of women get, get frustrated with support groups. And I'm putting that in air quotes because we're audio and of being uh, associated during my, my career with an organization in the Seattle area called Team Survivor Northwest. Um, and Team Survivor is all about exercise for women who've had cancer, not just mm. breast cancer. And I was on the board for sure. a couple of years. And um, what was so great about this organization is that it was entirely focused on exercise. You had to have had a cancer diagnosis, but it wasn't a support group, right? And so right. the yep. the relationships, the um, the conversations, the proactive effort of engaging in some kind of exercise in a group was so, you know, that kind of activity is so much more supportive than sitting around and bitching about how bad chemo is, which has its place. But, you know, we need to be looking for these um, these more positive approaches, like what you're doing with your organization is amazing because you're Absolutely. inviting these conversations for women to listen to and then maybe have with close friends or perfect strangers. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, in, in your example also, right, it's like, here's the reason why we're meeting up for exercise. We can all connect on some level because of a cancer diagnosis, but then the support is like the thread that happens mm -hmm. organically through these relationships and people are getting the the benefits of that type of support right. group, if you will, through those interpersonal connections, which I love. I feel like I could talk to you for hours. I definitely want to invite you back. I'm sure our listeners are like, oh my God, this like hour went by so quickly. Um, and I, I can't wait to continue the conversation. I know we started off talking about naturopath and your work, but then how it kind of touches upon all of these other cornerstones that you mentioned as well. So I really appreciate Dr. Laura, you taking the time to be on Breast Cancer Conversations today. And last but not least though, I want to make sure that you have an opportunity if there's anything that we haven't talked about or anything that you want to go back and reiterate or stress to our listeners that you have that opportunity, but then also how our friends can find you on like social media, if you use Instagram or Facebook, how people can stay in touch and follow your wisdom. Thank you. I'm so excited to be able to be here this morning. This has been a great conversation and you're really doing some amazing work and um, have a great platform. So I'm just, I'm thankful to be here and be part of the conversation. And I'd love to come back. I can talk about this stuff all day, every day. And, and <laughs> Pretty Clearly much I can't what I do, like right? <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I, um, this is the work that I feel really passionate about and where I have felt like I can make an impact. So if people are interested in finding out more about me and my practice and all the other things that I'm doing right now, um, it's just simply laurajamesnd.com. That's N as in Nancy, D as in David, naturopathic doctor. So laurajamesnd.com. Um, like me on Instagram and Facebook, you know, I'm still trying to grow those communities. Um, Instagram, it's Dr. Laura ND and Facebook, it's Laura A. James ND Fabno. 
and FABNO is that board certified naturopathic oncologist designation. Um, but one thing I do want to plug, and I've got lots of other things going on besides clinical care. Um, but one thing I do want to plug is that I am doing a five week survivorship program um, in October. And there's an in-person cohort and there is a virtual cohort. So, you know, for your listeners, probably virtual um, signups for that are going to happen very soon. And we're doing an early bird discount by August 15th. Um, but it's going to be every week for the five weeks of October. And we're going to talk about all of these other conversations. We're going to talk about osteoporosis and heart disease. We're going to talk about sex and intimacy. And I have a sex coach um, who is going to join me for that conversation. We're going to talk about nutrition and exercise. And I have a chef and exercise coach who's going to join me for that conversation. We're going to talk about grief and loss um, and we're going to talk about over, overall survivorship measures. So I think it's going to be a really awesome five-week program. And there's information Amazing. about that and all the other programs that I offer and free stuff and paid stuff and this, that, and the other thing um, on my website, laurajamesnd.com. Amazing. Thank you. And I'll be sure to put all of that in the show notes too. So for our listeners, you can just uh, check out all the links. It'll make it very easy for you to get the information and hopefully continue the conversation. So thank you so much. I appreciate you being here today. Thank you for having me. It's been really fun. And thank you everyone for listening to our show. I would like to acknowledge that all of the information on our podcast are from personal experiences and are not a substitute for professional medical advice. You should always contact your medical care team. If you're looking for specific topics or would like to be a guest on our show, please feel free to reach out to me. My email is laura at survivingbreastcancer.org. Until next time, keep on thriving.